Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for this panel, Mithun, Ambarish, and, and I. So the, I'll make a very, we'll just spend a few minutes uh, on the introduction and then uh, dive right into it and try to keep about uh, maybe 10 minutes uh, for Q&A at, uh, at the end of the panel. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to get a show of hands. How many folks here are entrepreneurs or looking to start a company within the next one year? Okay, that's a very good, uh, good, good chunk of the population. And the second is, how many folks here would be looking to raise funding in the next one year? Are looking, if you had, uh, if you're king for a day. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so I am co-founder and managing partner at Prime. We are an early stage uh, venture firm based out of here in in Whitefield. Uh, I could just give a quick introduction as well. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Aip. I'm the Chief Delivery Officer of Bank Bazaar. Uh, been part of the uh, uh, Bank Bazaar team even before fintech was a cool world. Cool world, actually. Uh, I basically take care of all the bank onboarding onto the site. Uh, my friends and I, we've been thinking about this idea for quite some time, and I joined the team very early on, even before Bank Bazaar was incorporated. Hi guys, my name is Amrish. Uh, Ashish, my co-founder and I, uh, we set up Pepfry in 2012. Uh, we sell furniture online and uh, try to do a decent job of it. Hey folks, I'm Mithun. Uh, I run Blohan. Uh, Blohan is a tech-enabled intrastity logistics company and uh, we have been around since 2014. Well, I'm going to start with you, uh, Mithun, here. So just go back to the stage when you were uh, still in a garage, right? This is... Uh, so... What, uh, what we find the narrative often hijacked uh, in the media is by the funding announcements, right? So the success of a company and its entire life seems to be bookended by when the initial funding occurs and when the exit occurs. And the conversation today is really about what happens beneath. So can you take us through the early stages when you're actually getting started with Blowhorn and not about really how the idea came about, but what was after that, right? Sure. You know, once you said that, yes, I'm going to do this, how did it, uh, how did it go about? Sure. So I think the first, uh, we, we are an intercity logistics company. I think uh, those were the years when there was a lot of hype about uh, taxi for sure and Uber and Ola, all of them fighting it out together. So when we started moving goods instead of people, uh, right? So uh, we kind of anticipated that there'll be a lot of clones coming in. Uh, so we kind of did a nice risk management kind of a scenario-based uh, thing where we knew that, okay, we will get copied, so how do we kind of devolve our risk? So I think one of the first things we did uh, was post the idea, uh, build the platform first, even before we started the business. And the uh, second thing we did was uh, we did not take money from our investor, even though we had committed investment till we uh, started getting revenues. So we kind of bootstrapped as much as we could. Uh, the third key piece and the most important piece for us was uh, getting drivers onto the platform. And what we did was very uh, stupid in hindsight, that we would sit in coffee shops and invite drivers to come and say, hey, you know, join the platform. And then my dad gave me a few words of wisdom and he said, look, without an office, nobody will trust you. So we kind of uh, faked it, like we took a membership at Regus, uh, 2,000 rupee membership per month. So basically we would get some free space to sit by the coffee machine. And uh, we would invite all the drivers to come to Regus. And then they would think that is our office, right? And then they were impressed and that's how we got our first supply. So initially, I think while you do all the basics, etc., you still need to kind of do some sort of a scenario planning. It kind of always helps to see, you know not drink your own Kool-Aid kind of, kind of a scenario. So maybe, uh, can you talk about your first big snafu in terms of like when you actually kick-started kick, uh, kick this process? Because I'm just thinking here, here you are, techie, you know, professional, dealing with folks who are driving trucks and so forth. There's a little bit of a culture gap here, isn't it? Absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, there's so many snafus, I, I can list a lot, but uh, I think one of the things which we took for granted was drivers will be able to kind of see the app and ride along with uh, having the app in the field of vision. 
So what happened was the first set of drivers, and the Tata Ace is like a very weird vehicle to kind of put your phone in. So within the first day, as I was training him on the app, he just went into a ditch because he was too focused on the app, right? So, you know, that is one snafu. And uh, I mean, we can just list out so many. Uh, but fundamentally, I think the other key piece is we also overestimated uh, our, uh, what do you call, our run rate as always. <laughs> you know, so we, we thought, hey, you know, we can last for 15 months, and we just lasted for 12 months thanks to hyper growth. Uh, so stuff like that. So basics, but uh, you never know what can go wrong till you actually do it. I think that is the key story here. So that's a great segue, uh, Amarish, uh, to you. So uh, if you can harken back uh, to the early days of, of Pepper Fry and tell us a little bit about uh, some of the pitfalls there and, and how did you go about that? Yeah, so, uh, so when Ashish and I started, we uh, basically put in our monies. And uh, there were a few things that we'd set out for ourselves to do, which we said that we won't compromise upon. Uh, so the first thing we said was we'd go for speed which means that we would build as fast as possible and we will skate as fast as possible. Uh, the second thing we said was that we'd try and work with the smartest, most passionate people that we've ever met. Um, and therefore, it was our job to get them on board. And the third thing we knew was that, and you know, uh, let me talk about that a little later, but the third thing we knew was that, frankly, we could not claim to be, you know, say the the Amazon of something or the Uber or something, because frankly, the business that we were in was uh, fairly new. I mean, nobody you really wanted to transport or had the idea of transporting furniture across thousands of kilometers, etc. in India, in a country where roads aren't you know, the best and you know, truck drivers don't reach on time and stuff like that. Uh, and so therefore, we knew that we would make tons of mistakes. Right? So there are three things which, so the first two were ambitions. One is speed. The other was working with the smartest people, most passionate people we, worked with, we knew. And the third was a problem or a pitfall that we knew we'd face. And uh, as we started our journey, uh, Ashish and I had worked for about 10 odd years uh, at, in corporate life. Both of us come from fairly middle class backgrounds. We, uh, so mother was a scientist. Ashish's dad works with the government of India. So frankly, no money from the families and so on. So all that we had was stuff that we kind of uh, uh, saved. Uh, and uh, in the first six odd months of our existence, we kind of just ran out of all of our savings. Right? We were getting stuff going. We were looking to scale the business. We were building our product and all of that we were doing out of our savings. So uh, I think between him and I, we had what, 10 lakh rupees left in the bank, uh, which is what we had to show for for like 10 years of WorkX. Uh, and then we decided what do we do with these 10 lakh rupees, and we said, hey, let's do an offsite in Goa. Uh, because if you got to fail, you might as well fail spectacularly, right? Uh, so we had about 31 people in Pepify at that point in time, uh, and we all decided to go to Goa, where we would spend two days, you know, not only partying, but also talking about what kind of organization we wanted to build. Uh, and those are the kind of calls which kind of stay with you as you, you scale, right? I mean, it's not when you raise $100 million from Goldman or, you know, you know many million dollars after that. Uh, it's these stories that kind of keep you going. Uh, and I think those were the kind of things which I wouldn't call them snafus or I wouldn't call them hiccups. Uh, I would just say that's part of every startup journey. I mean, frankly, what's the difference between an entrepreneur and anybody else? The fundamental difference is that the entrepreneur and there are lots of entrepreneurs in the audience or you know, plan to be entrepreneurs in the audience. The entrepreneur takes the risk. You have already done, I mean, once you begin you know, the entrepreneurial journey, you've already taken that huge big step. After that, everything's fine. It will work out. Have belief in yourself. Uh, have belief in the business that you're looking to create. And I think that's the principle that Ashish and I followed. So, you know, it's, it's, it was less about, I mean, I can count out snafus, you know, issues that we had and so on. But I don't think we ever let that get to us. We tried to celebrate every single victory we had. We tried to, you know, have fun celebrating every milestone we achieved. And we cried into our drinks and, you know, caught up with each other on everything that had gone wrong. And it was fine. It was just part of life. So let me... So so tell me how, how it felt when you have, I'm trying to imagine, you have 10 lakhs in the bank, you have 31 employees, right? 
uh, are you thinking that if I go to Goa and blow this all off and then I come back, I have to actually lay the people off and I have to shut this company down? And are you even thinking that second step or you're kind of saying, you know what, I'll just deal with it when it comes? What's, what's the thinking going on in your mind? Yeah, so the thinking is the following. Uh, you know, when you, when you truly make a great organization, uh, and this doesn't normally happen. I think we were lucky, Ashish and I, and we, we managed to do this. People don't actually ask you for salaries, especially when you're starting up. They buy into your vision. Uh, it's something that I haven't actually seen happen in any startup other than Pepperfly till now. Uh, and I'll tell you, they are the kind of people that you then build an organization and a culture around. So let me give you an example of, so when we came back from Goa, Novus Ventures decided to invest in us. So for, from a situation where there were 10 lakh rupees in the bank and all of that were also going into an offsite in Goa, we had suddenly $5 million in the bank. Uh, so you go from 10 lakhs to 24 crores, I think at that point in time the dollar wasn't at 60 levels, it was still at 40 something levels. Uh, but you know, it's not that. I'll tell you what happened in 2013. The same 30 people form the core of Paperfly. They are the ones who, who help you build your culture. So in 2013, when, uh, you know, so to speak, the first nuclear winter in e-commerce happened, right? Uh, that was a time when you know you needed to be an organization or you needed to be an e-commerce company which did at least a billion dollars of revenue, made a hundred million dollars of profit, and uh, had zero competition. And then people, venture capitalists, would look to even invest in you, right? Now, unfortunately, we were not a billion dollars of revenue. We weren't making a hundred million dollars of profit, and therefore, venture capitalists were not looking to invest in us. And at that point in time, we figured we had reached 110 people. We figured that you know we did not want to lay off people. We did not want to uh, you know do radical things because we are fundamentally making a great business, and that was a belief that existed across the organization. So these 30 people who went to Goa, we all took 75% pay cuts for a full year, so that not a single person needed to be laid off. And those 30 people today form the core of Pepperfly. They are the reason why you know. Uh, we have 1,400 people in Pepperfly today, 1,000 of them who have a contract staff, and we run a, you know, more than 1,000 crores worth of business with 400 employees, right? And the reason why we are able to do this is because some of the core elements of our culture, which are intensity, believing in something so passionately that you're willing to work twice as much as anybody else does at, and make half the money, uh, the fact that you know you have courage, which means the ability to stand up and say what's on your mind irrespective of what the audience is, etc., etc. Those are things that these 30 people got to the table. And I think, therefore, the decision that we took that point in time was the best culture-building decision that we ever made. At the end of the day, hey, it's fine. I mean, you know, it, it, ideas fail. People don't. And as long as you truly believe in that, and it's a very tough thing to believe in. I don't know whether everybody internalizes it. I think Ashish and I have internalized it. You know, some things go wrong, it's okay. The person's not the failure. That thing failed. And as long as you're able to figure that out and you're able to keep that distance between yourself and, you know, something that might go wrong, I think you'll, you do well. So that's very well put, Amrish. Uh, so, I, if you were uh, on the ground floor of, of Bank Bazaar, right, even before, uh, uh, when it was probably just a, a team around a table, a small table, uh, so if you can go back to that and tell us about the, uh, some of the key, uh, you know, decision points, because every, uh, uh, Ambarish mentioned about the time when they had the money in the bank and they actually decided to take a plunge and, uh, and move on. Uh, what were some of those moments, because every startup has them in the, in the early days? Um, so, so actually, Bank Bazaar is, you know, the founders, Adil Arjun, Rati, me, we were all in the uh, uh, U.S., and we had this idea that actually this idea happened when we came. We tried to apply for a loan, and it was such a painful process. And we thought that, hey, I was in Capital One. I was in Microsoft. Uh, Arjun was running Amazon's co-brand uh, card channel. We know what it means to run a card business or a loan business. Why can't we bring in those efficiencies here? Why can't we make it simple for the customer? And, you know, an online marketplace is where customers gravitate to to find information about a product, which is a commodity product, which they can... And this is a retail customer, obviously. So when we came here, I think we were clear about two things. One, 
we were clear that we wanted great people to run this place. Um, we want to get the best guys on this technology platform. And the second thing was to get a loan or a financial product instantly, paperless. And paperless is still our core strategy today, right? Now, a lot at that time, fintech was, I don't know if it's much of a word or people say, talking about fintech. Uh, all of our parents convinced us to go back to our, uh, our Microsoft, Amazon lives. Um, but we decided to stick on, right? Everywhere we went, so I think we had two issues. First, hiring was an issue. And we were based in Chennai. Um, we didn't have money to set up an office in Bangalore, which was the cool place for techies to work. Um, but, and we had an office which is about maybe the length of this panel. We had an office from day one, Mithun. So we didn't do coffee. I mean, we had coffee shops initially, but we soon got an office from an uncle of us, and it was this size. Um, the first thing was we knew hiring was a challenge, but we spent a lot of time networking, investing our efforts, going with our management vision to multiple events, talking to people. And our interview rounds would have been very long, like seven, eight rounds, which means that the filtration, if you had 100 people come in, maybe two would have gone through. In those two, you give an offer, you bake in uh, ESA up options because, we, again, we didn't have much monies to pay. One would drop off. You'll end up with one person. So the only way we could get more people in is by expanding the funnel on top. And to expand the funnel on top, we had to put ourselves more out there, meet more people, network more, and get it. Because we were all ready for multiple rejections. I think the first thing is, Know your vision, know your focus, get ready for rejection, but keep pushing through. The second thing that while we had on the hiring side, we had the same thing on getting the B component, which is the banks, the business component. How do you get the banks onto our side? All the banks loved our ideas. They said, wow, great guys, amazing technology, but you don't have enough traffic yet now, so maybe I'll think about coming onto you later. But your technology is really great, right? Uh, can I use your technology for my own platform? Because the future was very clear for everybody. You know, we just started capitalizing on it. But the future was that online is the way to go. Customers are going to come online, especially the premier customers are going to come online first. It will be good if we can capture them online. But I don't have the technology. You guys have technology. So which means they were trying to make us go to the B2B model. So we actually initially said, no, no, that's not a model. B2C is what we'll do. I don't want to get into the services company. But the, the, the later, you know, like how, you know, we often, every meeting we go to, that meeting turned out to be not, not a great meeting. But every time we do a meeting, be it good or bad, we always go back, think through what happened, what could we have done better. And we thought that, you know what, maybe you had to pivot a little, you know, maybe you had to be flexible a little because this gave us inroads into the bank. We were able to then, we just, we would, we would go back to the discussion board, tell them, yeah, we're okay trying this out. And we actually started that arm, got inroads into their platforms and their systems. I know we were able to then start sourcing customers for them, both on their platforms, which is powered by our technology, as well as our platform, which was a clause we put in. So I think, you know, there will be a lot of rejections. Uh, there'll be some people always will tell you, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? Um, we should be flexible enough to try a few things as long as it's not deviating much from your um, uh, focus. You know, and also one interesting thing is that I would say that, you know, the, the slide that uh, um, um, uh, Shailish actually put, uh, Shalil put actually saying that, you know, People who actually pivoted to B2B stayed alive for some time, and there were other folks who didn't pivot and shut down. I think that pivot, you know, I'm not saying that's the sole reason for us staying alive, but that really helped us in that time. And we slightly pivoted out after that, but that was a pivot, I think, which is required at that time. So being a little flexible helps, and just putting a lot of effort to get the right people into your team, I think, is what we focus a lot on. So, um, in just to pull this together in this thread, there are two points here. One is that uh, hiring is critical. 
you have to put a lot of time on hiring. So as, as founders, you're constantly selling, and one of the things which you're selling is the company and the vision. Yeah. Uh, and as Amrish pointed out, that, that core team which you build is going to uh, really determine the, uh, the future course uh, of the company. And the second thing is that you just have to get going, right? Uh, and as Mithin was saying, you have to just start off, the, guy, the driver might fall into a ditch, but that's the only way you're going to learn. And to your point, I, you kind of have to survive in order to be successful. <laughs> so it's sort of like a necessary condition here. Uh, so let me just uh, move on to the second piece, which is uh, funding, right? Uh, which is not all companies need funding, of course. Some of the companies can uh, be bootstrapped and become, uh, become profitable. But let's for the moment uh, restrict our discussion to the cases where we all need funding as a venture company true for all the companies here. And I want to just talk about the, uh, the ups and downs of that a little bit. So Mithin, just uh, uh, getting going with you, uh, can you talk about how that process was and what were uh, some of the challenges there uh, for you? I think uh, I'll break it down into, let's say, seed and series A, right? So uh, seed, uh, my co-founder was in the US. I told him, you better stay there because we are bootstrapping and you earn in dollars. So, you know, you build a tech there while I run the operations on the ground here. Uh, so uh, at, at the seed stage, I could either run the company or do the fundraise. So we decided to just, I decided just to be operational. And whichever fund walks into the office first, we'll take the money. Right? So we had uh, some commitment from uh, a U.S. investor called Tim Draper. Uh, we had not used this money yet, so we had to kind of uh, close in a little bit more money, right, just to kind of uh, get, get to a one or a 15-month runway, one year or 15-month runway. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, in two, three months after kind of starting, we, uh, Unitas uh, kind of reached out to us and uh, threw a mention in a TechCrunch article, and then, you know, uh, things happened. So... I'm sorry, there was not much of a strategy in my seed funding. It was a pretty bad strategy. In hindsight, I could have done much better. Uh, there were no funding platforms. There were no syndicates evolved as much as it has evolved now. So I think uh, I could have done a lot more research in uh, seed. CD say uh, it was a very different story uh, because uh, we decided, uh, we got the money in 2015, January. And we decided, okay, we'll, until we hit one crore, we want kind of, uh, in monthly revenue, we want to uh, do our next round of funding. And we hit it in uh, October and November, within uh, 10 months, you know. And once we did that, uh, we, uh, the whole, uh, I mean, the whole party stopped, right? So 2016 was like, you know, uh, it, was not, it was not a great year for fundraising. At that point in time, we had like, uh, Jan, I think we were staring down at two weeks of capital left. And uh, our investors obviously were not like super excited about this. And we took a decision there as well. I mean, it kind of, it's in parallel to what happened with Amrish's uh, experience in the startup, right? So uh, we cut down as much cost as we can. We did not fire a single employee. Uh, the core team members, as much as we could take uh, salary cuts, we took. The founders didn't take salaries. Entire 2016, we ran the company on cash flow. So we were always unit profitable right from day one. It was not sexy in 2015, but in 2016 it was necessary for survival. So I think uh, being a cockroach helped. And you know, survival, survivability itself is a selector. Because when we started, we had 50 odd commentators. And in, by 2016, mid 2016, it had kind of uh, thinned down to about 10 commentators who were relevant. And right now, we have probably two competitors in the market, right? So just survivability helps, and being very unit-focused helps, because, you know, Series A, it was all about... Uh, though in the U.S., Series A, they still look at product market fit, and in India, Series A, they already look at traction and uh, how well evolved your business is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one thing that helped us during Series A was... Uh, uh, fundraising was we got into Y Combinator, but we didn't join them. At the same time, we had a term sheet from our other investors also which came in, which kind of expedited the process a bit. Uh, so it's always difficult to create options, but when you can, if you can, if you can create multiple options in some other way, it will help expedite the process. But first and foremost is traction, right? You sort of like need that as a, as a base. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the basics of traction, building a great team, ensuring that you're capital efficient. I mean, these things have always held on for businesses to be 
uh, you know, uh, profitable and successful. I think these are the things you can never run away from. These are assumed. So, Amrish, uh, how was your uh, how was your plan, and how did you go about it? So, uh, so I think the number of people who would have said no to us would be legend. I mean, uh, uh, but I think uh, I, I guess what helped us eventually. And look, we've gone from series, so we never took seed funding. We uh, that's the money that Ashish and I put. Uh, so we went from series A to now we are series E. Uh, so it's been five journeys. I guess you know through the course of the journey, the thing that's worked for us is uh, that we've stayed true to plan. So what that means effectively is. Uh, you know, we were doing omni-channel. Uh, today we have 29, 30 stores, I think. We open a store a week now. Uh, so we were doing omni-channel when omni-channel wasn't sexy. Uh, we opened our first store in 2014, December, uh, because we figured that, uh, you know, a consumer is a consumer who could be online, offline, or on mobile, or, you know, using carrier pigeons to buy products. I mean, it doesn't really matter, uh, because it's the same consumer. And so therefore, we started doing stuff uh, from an omni-channel perspective when it wasn't a buzzword. We uh, started doing private labels at a time when it wasn't a buzzword. We set up our own logistics. So today, we are India's largest big box supply chain. Uh, we own India's largest big box supply chain. We have more than 300 trucks, uh, 18, 19 distribution centers. And the only thing that supply chain serves is pepperfry.com. Uh, and you know, so we did all of this when we, when we thought it was the right time to do it, and we had a strategy in place. So I guess staying, stu staying true to strategy worked for us. In the interim, of course, we had conversations with venture capitalists who wanted to change, wanted us to change our name. Uh, we had conversations with venture capitalists. Fortunately, we didn't change our name. Uh, we had conversations with venture capitalists who thought we had a great business model, but the you know the entire core team sucked. Uh, we had conversations with venture capitalists who, you know, it, so it's, it, if, if, you know, there are reasons to say no, there are many reasons to say no. Uh, fortunately, I guess we stuck with what we believed in, and uh, uh, we found partners who believed in us. And I think over a period of time, that's how it pans out. The one advice I would give, I mean, I guess and one advice that somebody gave me is, uh, and I'm going to just repeat it, is if you believe in something, stick to it. Uh, it's fine. I mean, what's the worst that will happen? You won't get funded. We'll figure out something else. So uh, tell me, like, you're in the middle of a pitch, and do you actually sometimes realize that, you know, this is not going to work? I mean, you're 10 minutes into a conversation with a VC, and so this is just not going okay. So I'm an eternal optimist. Um, I guess every conversation I walk into, I think that, hey, we are a good, we are a good company. Uh, I, I, I try and do my best to ensure that people see that we are a good company. Uh, so, you know, it's, I guess optimism is the, is the, either the blessing or the bane of an entrepreneur. Uh, and I guess I've been optimistic in every conversation. So I, so even 10 minutes into the conversation, if things aren't, if the questions are, you know, not questions which are, Oh, let's say questions out of far out of left field. Uh, you still go at it because, frankly, you never know. I mean, the, how do I put it? Uh, in the course of our history, there are folks who said no to us and said yes to us in the span of weeks. Uh, so things change. It's very often there are you know intricacies of your business which people get a little later, which they don't get in the first conversation, and I think. The, on, the optimism that you have as an entrepreneur and the belief that you have in your business helps for that transition to happen. So I guess I, I, I'm i like one of those eternal optimists. Uh, Saib, coming over to you. Uh, so you're in this, uh, you're thinking B2C, but you're kind of like going B2B because uh, the banks, that's the only thing which is which they are biting on, I guess, initially. So how do you go about uh, you know doing a pitch? Because now you have... So Sort of like two different uh, uh, two different threads here, right? Right. So um, while we did B two B for a short amount of time, uh, and we're still doing it in some cases, uh, we still kept B two C going. And when you're doing that pitch to the investor, the investor always asks the question, where we say that the B two B piece helps us uh, uh, get the bank's confidence that one we can bring, build strong technology. And using that, we could build inroads into their technology platforms. Now, in 2008, uh, let me tell you this, right? 
the competitor that we had then was an apna loan or an apna paisa. And whenever we went to any partner, uh, partner bank, they would say, oh, you're apna loan. Uh, you're a lead generator. Uh, and to which we would always have to explain to them that we're not a lead generator. We're a complete online acquisition platform where you can actually complete your process online. And hence, and earlier the model was the spray and pray model. You get a number, mobile number, and you give it to like five partners. We never did that. We were very, very um, possessive about a customer and made sure that he went to one guy or one partner who would do well. Now, this was always a question that every investor brought up and when, in which we said our core focus is still the B2C platform, but B2B is a way for us to go forward, a way for us to move along on this. But I think the investors always said that there are limits to that in our particular channel because um, customers would always want to go. And by here, our customer was a retail customer. So he would always, always gravitate towards the B2C model. To which, and very, and luckily for us, that was actually very, not luckily, it's strategically the right thing. It is aligned to our uh, focus as well. Our focus was, was always the B2C. So we gave a timeline, and, uh, like a sunset timeline for all our partners saying that this will be up to so much we would do this. Post that would be the pure B2C model. But I actually wanted to um, echo a lot of what um, Ambrish said in the, um, when you're talking to the investors, right? Um, the investors, uh, you know, been to multiple meetings. And one thing I think uh, uh, Adil, uh, the CEO of Bank Bazaar, always says is that we don't meet the investors when you need the money. Always keep in, uh, meeting them. Uh, and that's, and, and meet them when you don't need the money. Um, use that networking, connect with them. They'll give you ideas. This, um, you um, go for these events. So, you know, that's something which he has been very true to. And I've been to a lot of investor meetings with him, even when we were not looking for funding. The ideas they gave, the ecosystem that they had with them, always helped us move things forward for us. Uh, investors will always tell a lot of things. There were a couple of investors who were very close to um, closing something with us, then they put some conditions which we were not keen on. Um, and, but we still decided to hold true to our ideas and not go ahead with the conditions, and that investor backed out. But that's okay. We kept trying and we got someone else in place. So I completely um, uh, agree to what Ambrish said. Stay core to, I mean, stay focused on what your core goals are. For us, it was the B2C, paperless model, and we're going to do it in a technology manner. Let's do it that way. So, uh, the takeaways here being that, you know, from, uh, uh, from Mithun's, that initial funding means nothing. You can still run out of money. And uh, that you should never stop fundraising, really, right? I mean, uh, for a CEO or the founders, the fundraising is a continuous process. I'll just do one more question here, because I'm getting the time indication there. Uh, we are often asked about, like, the best advice you have gotten. But I'm going to ask you guys about the worst advice you got. Uh, which you would uh, really hope that nobody, uh, uh, nobody ever follows, which you got or you have heard about it. So I'm going to start first with you, Ipe, uh, put you on the spot here. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs here. What would you say is, uh, you know, what not to do here? So, um, so I think uh, during, uh, when Amrish was saying during the, the nuclear uh, fallout of uh, 2000, I guess, 14, 15. Um, you know, at that time, everyone, like, before that, everyone's talking about, I guess we don't have a GMV concept over here, but there was a lot of push to increase um, our throughput or to increase the amount of sales, right? Now, as a company, right, you know, I think uh, going back to my earlier point on survivability, We've never actually hired like crazy, and we've never let go of people, right? We've always been having this sustained growth path. So when we were talking to some of the investors, and at that time they said, why don't you burn more, increase your top line, right? Now that was very uh, different to the model that we had been very comfortable with. We were comfortable with more sustained growth. Now, we actually took a bit of, the ex bit of that um, uh, advice, we took it. 
and we expanded uh, our team in one area. And when we started doing it, we realized that the burn was way too much and we didn't want to put us in that very scary position of being running out of cash much sooner than uh, what we had planned for. And we immediately cut back. But, you know, I mean, going back to what we said, we listened to an investor, we did something, but we realized quickly that that's not core to us and went back, right? So our, our uh, growth story was sustained growth, surviving long, and that was also inbuilt in our culture as a company, right? So I think that was one bad advice which came to us. Luckily, we held back before the whole thing um, kind of uh, went upside down. Yeah. Ambarish? So I'll go to the piece where I was advised by somebody who was fortunately not on the board of Pepper Fryer, not an investor, uh, to change our name. Uh, and I, I, I get it. I mean, at some level, Pepper Fry is really not the name for a furniture company. It would have been perhaps easier for that person if we were called Fabulous Furniture or something like that. It's just that it was boring. The other point on that was when Ashish and I started, right? Uh, and the reason we didn't change was actually not because we thought fabulous furniture was boring. Uh, but when Ashish and I started, we put three words on the, so to speak, whiteboard. We said we'd want to build a truly Indian company. Uh, we'd want to build an honest company. And we want to have fun along the way. Uh, and that's, those were our three mantras for how we were building Pepper Fry. Now, Pepper is something that India has been famous for for ages. And so therefore, you know, that was a logical choice. It's also a very honest spice. Everybody else, everybody knows the smell, taste, etc. of Pepper. Uh, however, it's a little boring because it's honest and everybody knows the smell, taste, etc. And the fun of it comes when you fry it. So Pepper Fry, the name, was intrinsic to the three things that we built this company on. And uh, fortunately for all of us, uh, I mean for us definitely and hopefully our customers, we managed to build a really exciting company selling furniture called pepperfry.com and did not take the advice of changing a name. Mithin, I close it out with you. So I think at uh, a very early stage in our business, we were trying out uh, uh, two-wheeler deliveries. And uh, the unit economics never worked for us. I mean, we still don't know how it works. Two-wheeler logistics, let's say, for like single point pickup and single point drop. Uh, we experimented on it for two months, and uh, there was a very large investor who kind of invited us, and uh, he looked at our numbers. We had scaled it up from zero to 2,000 deliveries a day in like three weeks, and he said, scale it up to 10,000, I'll give you the check. And, uh, and at that point, we told him, look, it's still not making sense for us because the unit economics is not working out. Uh, and then a lot of our advisors uh, or people I kind of uh, uh, asked for advice, rather. Uh, they came and told, hey, you know, you should do it. You should do whatever it takes to kind of get the money in. It's a big check. And then you can change your business model later. So that, that was, I think, in hindsight, bad advice because if you – I meet those investors even now, and they kind of agree that I took the right call then by not getting into that. Uh, so stuff like that, like the financial pressure when you're a small startup to kind of do different things to kind of please your investors comes in. So I think uh, as the other guys have chimed in, I think staying true to your vision and mission kind of always helps. So I guess you know your business better than the investors do, and that's, yes. that's important to remember that. Absolutely. Uh, do we have time for one question in the thing or no? So, I have, so uh, I'm sorry we ran out of time. But thanks a lot, Mithun, Ambarish, and I for a fantastic panel. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.